You're listening to The Rewatchables 1999 from Luminary Media. I'm Chris Ryan. I'm joined by Bill Simmons and Sean Fennessy. Mike, try Mr. Wallace. This is The Insider. What does this guy have to say that threatens these people? Well, it isn't cigarettes are bad for you. He's only the key witness in the biggest health reform issue in U.S. history. He met an insider who was ready to reveal what no one else could tell. I was told, don't talk. Al Pacino. The more truth he tells, the worse it gets. Russell Crowe. I told the truth. It's not the point whether you told the truth or not. The Insider, a Michael Mann film, rated R. Starts Friday, November 5th. All right, guys, Chris Ryan, I'm back in the hosting seat where I belong with mm. Bill Simmons, Sean Fennessy. We're you doing finally did it. 1999's The Insider, Michael Mann's follow up to Heat, starring Al Pacino and Russell Crowe. Uh, and Al Pacino's. Is that a wig? What's going on? <laughs> How dare you? What's going on with his hair in this movie? <laughs> his hair is blown dry to perfection. He looks like he just got off a motorcycle, <laughs> but filmed every scene that way. Yeah, he, he's right off the set of a White Snake video, I think. <laughs> How much would I have to pay you to wear Al Pacino's wardrobe from this movie? Uh, and, and wig. I mean, it's about to be back I in think, style. I think I will devolve into Solid that. Solid colors, baggy khakis, you know, he's, a, a duster. <laughs> he's 20% away from being Phil Spector. <laughs> That's it's really out of control. He's also twenty percent away from being a full blown hack. But yeah. this is like this is the last, right at the end, oh, the last, last grasp. one. I will not hear any criticism. I feel this like is one of my favorite performances. By last him. grasp, insomnia is the tail end. Yes, and oh. then it flips. Exactly. I this completely agree. Yeah. This film was released on November fifth, nineteen ninety nine. Directed by Michael Mann. It was released by Disney, which is remarkable to think about now in yeah. retrospect. The idea of this coming out Surprising. from the mouse. Uh, it was budgeted at a a really efficient $68 million <laughs> for a movie that constitutes mostly people talking on phones. And if you want to know where that $68 million was spent, I'll tell you, Michael Mann. Because yeah. he was like, it's important for this 10-minute sequence that I take Christopher Plummer to Israel. You know, yeah. and, sh- and shoot all, all the stuff you see from Mississippi to New York, uh, the Keys, Louisville, the Middle East. They went there, they shot there, they brought Russell Crowe there. At all the expenses that that would take, plus the enormous amount of research that man put into the... You're saying they could have done that in San Bernardino? I'm saying that it, it were they to make this a Netflix show, I think a lot of this is happening at the lot across the, the hallway here. Mm. Um, so budgeted at $68 million, and it made what is a, a relatively paltry, even at the time, $29 million at the box office. That was, being said... It felt like a bomb in the it moment. Did. It did, and we can talk a little bit about that. Joe Roth was very articulate about um, the challenges of, of marketing the insider in a lot of ways. It kind of closes the door on a certain kind of movie being made, at least at Disney and then in the future, really Hollywood itself, uh, yeah. with few exceptions over the next decade or two. That's why we like 1999. Absolutely it's right. one of the last years. End of an era. Uh, for as much as box office audiences turned their back on this movie, the Academy embraced it, giving it seven nominations, including pretty much all the big heavy hitters. Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Best Adapted Screenplay. It did not win any of them. In fact, it pretty much got swept by American Beauty in all those categories. Yeah. So Beauty won Best Picture, Mendes won one Best Director, Kevin Spacey won Best Actor. Who beat of, Who beat Plummer? Uh, Plummer, I don't, was Plummer nominated? He was not nominated. I think he got the Globe, right? Or he was nominated for- I was saying, Plummer not getting nominated is a tough look for this movie because he's- one of the standouts for me rewatching it. But yeah, he's I know still we're gonna get to him. flossing his teeth from chewing all the scenery in this movie. He God. is something else. <laughs> he uh, he won the LA Film Critics Circle Award, and he was nominated for uh, he was not nominated for an Oscar or a Globe. Yeah, he's also like Gene Hackman, where he's been the same age since like 1975. I, I have no idea how old he is. Oh, Christopher Plummer. Oh, uh, yeah, Plummer. he doesn't look like he's aged a day from The Insider, and that you know, despite it being twenty years ago, are there pictures of him like a twenty-four-year-old Christopher Plummer? Because I feel like they're probably. I mean, isn't. he was about thirty-five in The Sound of Music. He was the star <laughs> of The Sound of Music. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Um, so obviously directed by Michael Mann, one of me and Bill and Sean's favorite filmmakers. Now, don't yes. include Sean. I'm no. really no, honored no, to be here on a Michael Mann podcast with with the two Mannanites, <laughs> the Minologists. He's not included. Um, he was so mad when we did the Miami Vice rewatchable. Said that he got excommunicated from the club. Well, I think that this is a, a 
Uh, I'm excited to be on this one because I Thank think you. this is truly his last great masterpiece. I think oh, this is man, man's right one the of his last genuinely <laughs> iconic works of, of cinema. Written by Michael Mann and Eric Roth. Based on a Vanity Fair article by Marie Brenner, this is the true story of a tobacco industry whistleblower named Jeffrey Wigand, played by Crow. Vanity Fair is a magazine that was printed on paper until a couple yeah, years ago. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, come on, it's Wigand and his relationship with 60 Minutes producer Lowell Bergman, played by Al Pacino, and their efforts to bring Wigand's testimony to American airwaves despite resistance from the tobacco industry and 60 Minutes' 60 Minutes' is CBS corporate overlords. It was man's first movie since Heat. It is in many ways his most restrained film. It is stylistically, it's really interesting because, you know, you've got Last of the Mohicans. Last of the Mohicans is basically this moving landscape painting. It's this gorgeous romantic movie. Then you've got Heat, which in some ways is the urban version of Last of the Mohicans. And then Insider marks where man starts making all these really wild formal decisions. And most of Insider is like, shot from someone's collar. It's mm. it's like a handheld camera, Dante Spinati, who shot last time he can shot heat. He also shoots the insider, but they're essentially trying to visualize what it's like for people to make decisions and what they're feeling, what they're thinking as they're going through these life-changing decisions. Um, it's his most restrained film in a lot of ways. It's also one of his least successful movies. Uh, Pacino. I want to talk a little bit about Pacino, which, you know, you think we talked about him a lot, but I specifically... I really want to talk about this 90s run for just a second because this caps it. This is the 90s for Al Pacino. Godfather 3, Dick Tracy, Glengarry Glen Ross, Frankie and Johnny, Send of a Woman, Carlito's Way, Heat, City Hall, Donnie Brasco, Devil's Advocate, The Insider, Any Given Sunday. My favorite Pacino performance other than The Godfather. Is, is Any Given Sunday? Yeah. Well, that's insane. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was one of the first rewatchable spots we yeah. did. I, I I just love him in any given Sunday. I absolutely just love that performance. The inches speech is all time for me. And that movie's terrible and he's carrying it like LeBron carried the two thousand seven caps. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Let's go back. So not dog day afternoon. Not I'm Serpico. just saying my personal not favorite. Not Panic in Needle Park. Not Cruising, one of your all time oh, favorites. He's great in cruising. Clear out for cruising. Cruising's unbelievable. Not Sea of Love. He's kind of creepy and nicotine in Sea Love. He is pretty nicotine. It like works that. for the movie, though. He's making out with Ellen Barker. It's just gross. Oh, yeah. That was like one of the first times I was like, is that what kissing is? <laughs> she's mauling her face. <laughs> you know, I was just like, is that how you're supposed to kiss? How Actually, many women's faces have you sucked off because of Sea of Love? <laughs> Actually, I'm sorry. I'm going to put heat above it any given Sunday. What do we got? What do we got? Give me all you got. I wanted to see the reason why I listed these movies. We usually go through major movie stars, decades of the runs they go on. But he and Crow are really interesting because Pacino obviously has this 10 year run that's kind of a coronation for the career that Sean so eloquently outlined right there with Godfather and Serpico and but you all these let, other things. Before I know where you're going with the Crow thing, but you left out one key part. He kind of was gone. Pacino. And C. Lovey yes. comes back and it's like, oh yeah, Al Pacino, I love this guy. But he was basically doing plays and God knows what else for, I don't know, seven years. Well, that's what I'm saying. Since it's like, Scarface. In a lot of ways, he comes back, he makes up for lost time with all the films he does in it's the a 90s. a big part of this, though. And to Sean's earlier point, every movie is this dance with falling off the edge of, of believability of, are you doing too much with this? And, you know, in each one you can say, Oh, God, he was so incredible in this moment and so ridiculous in the next moment. Do you have a favorite film from this 90s run, Sean? Mm, a favorite, is, favorite Pacino performance from this 90s run? Well, that's he's going to see Devil's Advocate, which is also well, insane. No, 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 no. Well, well okay, so Look, I'll just... But, but don't touch! <laughs> touch! But don't taste! <laughs> taste! But don't swallow! <laughs> Okay. Uh, I'm a fan of man. <laughs> the thing is, is the theory, the theory of Pacino is that he was broken by Scarface. That the performance that he gives in Scarface essentially knocks him off of his axis and he loses sight of what is over the top and what is nuanced. Because the guy in The Godfather in The Godfather Part Two is one of the most sophisticated American actors we've ever seen. Yeah. He shows darkness with a very subtle look. He shows loud in impressive ways. Scarface is when he goes to the absolute edge of parody and still keeps you involved. And then, like you said, Bill, he kind of disappears. He takes, like, with the exception of one movie, six years off. Mm -hmm. He was in Revolution in 85. 
and that was it. See you, Love 89. He wasn't even like uh, doing a cameo. In exactly. Movie. He's just gone. So he's off and he's doing theater and he's, I don't know, reassessing his self-worth. And then he comes back in the 90s and he takes on a lot of roles. Mm-hmm. He works a lot in the 90s. I think that The Insider is probably his best performance because it's the one that is the most finely calibrated between loud, crazy, and kind of subtle and stormy. And he has always been able to dance with both of those emotions. I mean, you guys might say Heat. You might say Donnie Brasco. That's also an interesting performance. I think I agree with everything you're saying, except I think uh, Son of a Woman broke him, not Scarface. Because if you watch See You Love, he's not doing that in See You Love. Yeah, he's not doing it I actually think it's It's like kind of just older... 70s Pacino in a movie and then sent a woman he dials that one up and I don't think he could ever fully come back from that right but, but even in, in Dick Tracy and Godfather Part 3 like he's pretty over the top he's he's really doing like Dick character- Tracy is like a parody movie though yeah but it, I mean it's it, it's it's asking Godfather him to 3, be a cartoon though, he's with just a bunch of schmucks he's with George Hamilton and Sofia Coppola and yeah I, I think he felt like if I don't dial it up, this movie's dead. Mm-hmm. It felt intentional to me. So after Scent of a Woman, I don't think it was intentional anymore. And that's what, even in Heat, which we love, yeah. he has moments in Heat that he just wouldn't have done as an actor in the late 70s. And There's I think no that way. Even something as well written as Glenn Gary, which is one of my favorite performances from this run. He's big in that. He's really big in that. It's just the material is so specific and weird and like it's exact about the real estate business and all the language comes from the salesman. It's not like you can't really even discern what he's talking about when he's doing his big big runs in Glen Gary. So that's one of the reasons why that's my favorite. Well, well the, the diner scene in Heat, he's not parody Pacino no, yet. No, no, And I think if that scene comes along six years later, there's a slam of the coffee table and like he's doing three choices that maybe don't make yeah, sense. What, what do you guys think of Donnie Brasco? Because I think that that's actually a pretty subtle performance. There's something a little bit shticky about it because it's very accent heavy and he's playing like a real schnook. But I think that that's a pretty, there's there's not a lot of scent of a woman I'm not a isms huge in it. fan of the movie itself. I don't, I don't, not a huge I fan. I feel like they're both too mannered in it. Uh, it. It feels like two guys like running away from what makes them Movie stars in a lot of ways. Can't have a I, British guy direct an American gangster yeah. picture. It's a I have I have a confession to make and Sean's gonna be mad. I don't like Johnny Depp. I agree well, with you. Well, I I'm not I'm not Johnny I'm not Depp gonna guy. defend Johnny Depp in the year twenty nineteen. Um no no, I'm saying I just have never never at any point just, in my life Edward was like, Oh hands. cool, Johnny Depp has yeah. a new movie. I was always like, Why isn't Val Kilmer getting in these roles? <laughs> I was always like Team Kilmer. <laughs> there was a time like when, they were on their corner when Johnny Depp corner. was really the most interesting actor. I, I get the it. The Ed Wood time, that was, he was really, he was he was brave. He was willing to do things that other actors are not willing to do. Now, I, I, it's a joke. Did you know there's a Johnny Depp movie out this week called The Professor? You familiar with this? About a professor who learns he has cancer? Really? You're not. He was used to be the biggest movie star in the world, and yeah. now he just releases movies uh, no one's ever heard of. He was in that movie where it's like he's investigating years. Tupac's death, right? Yes, that's right. Did that ever come out? I don't know. Um, it goes fast, man. Look at Travolta. He's direct to video now. Yep. Speaking of going fast... Let's yeah. talk about Russell Crowe's five-year run here, where he so when he did, but when he did this movie, it was the, I guess I'm stepping on no, you. No, the rocket's going Just up. The, but he's 33 and he's playing this guy who's yeah supposed to look like he's 50 plus, mm-hmm. and it was a really kind of ambitious. I'm not positive he should have done it role yeah. at the point of career he was at. Al Pacino, you're talking 1970s through the first decade of the 2000s. He's still a relevant actor, I think. Russell Crowe pretty much has the entire career in five years, and from 97 to 02. I mean, he's obviously still around. He's still doing stuff. But LA Confidential, Mystery, Mystery Alaska, The Insider Gladiator, Proof of Life, Master and Commander, Beautiful Mind, Cinderella Man, Good Year. Chris, we covered all this in our iconic <laughs> I know. Proof of Life podcast. I'm just talking about his— com- the, the com- I nominated the Peabody Committee. It's, boy, he should get out of here, and Helen Mirren should come by, and because <laughs> she's such a fan of that podcast. For those of you who are not aware, <laughs> Proof of Life is a movie that was released in the year 2000. It stars Russell Crowe and Meg Ryan. And You've Caruso. probably not heard the episode of The Rewatchables because no one on Earth has seen this film. <laughs> Can I give you the moment when it ended for Pacino? Mm-hmm. I think Insomnia was the last— Pacino and De Niro had this point, and I'm a little older than you guys, but like anytime they released a movie, it had to be taken seriously yeah, of should absolutely. I go? Absolutely. It was an event. Yeah, it was like, these guys have a movie, I'm going. Like it was, you didn't even think twice. And Insomnia was like that for me. But then the next three, it ended with Simone. 
Simone was his next movie. And then he did The Recruit and Geely. And then it just, the and two for the money, 88 minutes. And it's just, it's just ending. And that ends up with Righteous Kill with De Niro in 2008. When mm -hmm. think how it was those two guys in a movie and nobody cared. He does have good performances mixed in. Angels in America is pretty amazing. Danny Collins That's is fun. Fair. We both like that. Danny Collins is this decade though. Yeah. 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 I'm just saying over the last 15 years, he has done, there have been things where you're like, even Paterno, which I don't think is totally successful. He's I think what it. he's doing is really yeah. cool yeah. and interesting. My point was more like, it was an event when he was in a movie right up, right up until around now. And this was the first time I remember a Pacino movie that seemed like it was an Oscar contender, all that stuff, just not doing well. And maybe that was because of the substance of it. I don't know. And this is, this will, I think will be true for talking about Crow, but this is the most important Pacino year, maybe since The Insider, because this is the year of The Irishman, mm -hmm. the new Scorsese movie. Yeah. And he's also in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, the new Quentin Tarantino yeah. movie. Do you think he's going to have much of a role in that movie? We'll see. Yeah. I don't know. So your point, I mean, I interrupted you, but no, your was point basically is Pacino's like, going this way and Crow's going this it way. It is, but it's passing. also like, yes. it's an interesting statement about the state of the movie business because Pacino gets three decades to be Al Pacino. Al, Russell Crowe gets five years. Now, part of that- Isn't that self-inflicted though? I think part of that is this movie almost in a weird way despite it being an incredible Crow performance and very worthwhile of being nominated for Best Actor, you can see this guy kind of like, oh, do I want to be this chameleonic, shape-shifting character actor or do I want to be Master and Commander Cinderella Man action, like, leading This is man? the Val Kilmer, Brad yeah. Pitt conundrum, right? Yeah. So he puts on all this weight, goes gray, plays 15 years older than he is in The Insider, and he's remarkable. And then it kind of is, it, it's a tale of the tape for him because in every movie, he's pretty much fighting against the fact that he's aging, that he's gaining weight, that he's like, he's not really in the shape to do movies like Proof of Life after 1999, 2000. Yeah. Proof of Life is his, I think his best kind of movie star performance. Yeah. In this movie, it's interesting how restrained he is and how he's really trying to play a character the whole time. And there's only one moment when it comes out when when it's all falling apart at the end and Pacino's like, put him on when the he's phone golfing. with the hotel guy. <laughs> no. Put him on the phone, put him yeah. on the phone. And then he's like, tell him to get your fucking ass on the phone. And the guy swears. And Russell Crowe springs up and grabs the phone. Yeah. It's very Russell Crowe. Like you can kind of, he turns the switch on. I just think the guy was really talented. I think so too, but I don't think of this as a Russell Crowe movie. And I know he was the one who was nominated for Best Actor, but revisiting it, it's a Pacino. It movie. does not work without well, Pacino. Pacino like, also gets the last hour of the movie, yeah. pretty much. It's it's much the it's called the Insider, but the the crisis is much more oriented around Pacino's character in part. And also, I think the way that it's aged because of the conversation about the news media and the power of the news yeah. media, it makes much more sense as the Lowell Bergman story than it does the Jeffrey Wigand story. So it, it kind of is, though, right? Yeah. They just kind of marketed it, and I think Bergman. As is, I think Mann was interested in Bergman and Wigan, but I think he connected with Bergman. Yeah. And Berg, he, he talked a lot about, he sees himself as an investigative reporter. He's like, when I make these movies, I do a lot of investigative reporting. I do a lot of talking to sources like Bergman does. I've known Bergman for a long time. He said that when he was making Heat, Bergman was doing the Wigan reporting and they were in touch. So you can tell he sees him as a fellow traveler in that regard. Mm -hmm. I wanted to talk a little bit about you bring up the news media. The thing that really leaps out about this movie is the concept of what a scandal is and how that's changed over the years. And whether or not, even at the time they're making The Insider, that has the same impact as, say, All the President's Men, which is a movie this is obviously not, if not modeled after, they're hoping to capture that same kind of, that wave that people had when they saw All the President's Men. And, you know, this movie comes out in 99, about a year after Clinton's impeached. Yeah, It's made by a generation of people who were raised on Watergate who went through Iran-Contra. But Bill, I was thinking like this might be a good good thing for you to weigh in because you're like... Because I'm old. Well, because you have a little bit more of like a perspective on it. <laughs> do you remember the cigarette stuff being significant? Like, do you remember being like, wow? No, I, I remember learning are, a lot of it from this movie, actually. Yeah. So you don't remember the 60-minute segment or this controversy in little, the news? A little bit. I mean... It's not like everybody didn't know cigarettes were bad for you. They say that in this movie. I mean, yeah. like in that little lunch table think, conversation, they're like, you know, it's not like everybody. So cigarettes I think what are bad was for interesting, you. Everybody uh, knows that. Yeah. The, the, the cool part about this movie is the lengths that the cigarette companies were trying to go to really not have it out there that cigarettes are bad for you. But 
everybody knew cigarettes were bad for me. I remember when I started smoking at bars and freaking the year after college, after like three drinks, it wasn't like I was like, this is great. Yeah. There's going to be no ramifications at <laughs> yeah. all. Like mm -hmm. there was a danger to it because you knew it was bad and you knew people were dying of lung cancer left and right. So I think it was, you know, there's certain movies, JFK, who I think all of us love for different reasons, and that became the assassination movie. But we know like half of that movie is full of shit. This movie really does capture the specific moment with the cigarette industry that played out with the lawsuits yeah. and everything. So do I'm you, glad it exists. Do you remember 60 Minutes being a major thing for you ever? Was it, Were you ever like, a, it's Sunday night? Yeah. It's time to watch 60 Minutes? Oh, beyond minutes. that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was... It was the biggest show in the world. I just for remember doing years. something yeah. being preempted by football. No, I mean, I obviously watched 60 Minutes. Yeah. Well, it felt, especially with football, with somewhere else saying, coming up on 60 Minutes, <laughs> the yeah. cigarette industry. Yeah. It was just baked into my Sunday night viewing, I think. The yeah. football game ends and you just go right into 60 yeah. Minutes. That was You're also years. talking like an incredible amount of people. Yeah. Like, oh, unbelievable. The number one show now versus the number one show then. It's like you're talking 30 million people that is, per episode. in the movie. Yeah. Say, he says 30 million people. I think it's hard sometimes to, if you're a modern viewer, to understand that. Like, there's a lot of hubris depicted by Don Hewitt, Mike yeah. Wallace, uh, all the guys and all the, everybody's working on 60 Minutes. They have like their chest puffed out because they're like, we're, we're the gold standard. We're a big deal. Yeah. And if we do this story, it's going to be a really big deal to the American people and we take that responsibly. And you can kind of th see like, oh, well, this seems like they're being conceited. But like, that was significant. If it was on 60 Minutes, it was essentially a table setter for the American conversation for at least a week. Yes and no, though. I mean, you basically underlined, I think, the crisis of Bergman's character at the end of the movie because Bill, who was there watching football in 1996, I can't remember, 97, whenever this mm -hmm. is actually taking place, kind of doesn't really remember this as a significant news controversy yeah. or segment on the show. And I probably wouldn't either because when you watch 60 Minutes, there's just four segments in every episode and you just go on and on and on and there, on and on. There was just always controversies. So this was right. going on at the same time as Lewinsky and yeah. you know, there's seven things going on. It's like, oh yeah, cigarettes are bad for you. But crucially not a trouble. million things. You know what I mean? Like right. We live in mm -hmm. a world now where it's like you regularly see the tweet where it's like, this has happened, and this has happened, and this has happened, and it's only Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, you know, and it's kind of become baked into our this game daily experience of like, hashtag this league. Looking this at league. our phones, looking at the paper or whatever, and you're just like, oh, it seems like the world's falling apart. But well, you also didn't have, you know, this is obviously 20 years for social media, but you didn't have what we have now, where you have all these social justice warriors on the internet going nuts because. First of all, what the cigarette companies are doing in general, but then a story getting squashed in the outrage society, like people would have lost their fucking minds if it was like CBS buried the story because they were afraid of the cigarette companies. Can you I, imagine? But it would Twitter? be pretty amazing to see Mike Wallace be on TV and say, like, I can't tell you. CBS is afraid of this story, so I can't even say who this guy worked for. Which goes back to one of the reasons we want to do this year is mm -hmm. like, this movie in the context of 1999 makes so much sense. Yeah. And it's a completely different movie. They even talk about, in the writing of it, about how uh, it's very old school pre-internet. There's only a couple cell phone scenes. There's a lot of like reading the newspaper. It's all dialogue. Dueling faxes. And, yeah. It was like that thing. You wrote a piece. When did you write that piece for us? Just a couple months ago. A couple yeah. months ago. Like, it's that's one of the reasons I love the 1999 movies. I really feel like they're contained to the specific yeah. way we lived before things changed. Very tactile. A couple yeah. of years later, you could see a world in which the transcript from that interview and maybe even Wygan's identity is revealed on like the smoking gun. But we're not quite at that place yet oh, too yeah, with the internet. Like, oh, you know, yeah. it would have been there would have been a different way that a controversy like this would have been not just analyzed but processed. You know, it would have th things could have come to the fore in different ways at the time. Basically, the last moment, really, when broadcast news media was the dominant news media, because cable news media is now the dominant news sure. media. Well, we're doing Blair Witch later this season, or at least 10 minutes on it, and I think that's a similar thing, that just four years later, that movie doesn't happen. Couldn't right. have worked. Couldn't have happened. Yeah. This movie, I feel like we would have had just way more intelligence by the mid-2000s just about what happened with this scandal. And, yeah, and I think um, the opposition research would have been much more pervasive because that's what tends to happen with almost every story now is like a story will drop and then there's like five counter stories about like the biases or the yeah. biographies of the people who are pushing that story that happened with like the Steele dossier that's happened like a lot with any Trump reporting and 
tragically hasn't happened probably like we haven't gotten the 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 things that have happened over the last couple of years that you're like the Flint story should be the only the Flint water story should just be the only thing we think about. Yeah, and yet we're so distracted by everything else that there isn't like a centrality to the stories. Like that's one thing that I thought was kind of I was very nostalgic about was that while I really do obviously appreciate even for self interested reasons the fact that a lot of people who traditionally didn't have access to a platform now do, and including myself. There was something kind of like organizing about there being a local paper and the Times and the Post and the CBS Evening News and CBS 60 Minutes. And if those stories made it to those levels, they really, really, really garnered a lot of attention. It was conquerable too yeah. for a consumer. You could just, you could get everything you needed. Yeah. I remember finishing the Times in the early 2000s <laughs> and being like, oh, I finished it. Yeah. It's done. <laughs> I've, like, I finished reading it today. And now you can't finish reading anything. You can't finish consuming anything. And so it makes it more difficult for something to emerge as seriously significant. The New York Post was great with that. You'd just be done. Just be like plowing through this. Yeah. Oh, arts and entertainment. You could read the New York Post hey, on a somewhere, right? Yeah. 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 And just kind of go through. Sean, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this idea, which is this parallel kind of in the movie and then in real life. In the movie, we're seeing the early days of maybe not a news organization, but maybe a more traditional media company. Steve Tisch, I believe, is the owner of CBS at the moment. And then he's going to sell it to Westinghouse, which will eventually become hundreds of other conglomerates and Mm. different other Viacom corporations. And we've seen this happen over and over again to pretty much every significant media company. And then inside the film itself, so that's happening inside the film. And on the outside, you see this sort of being one of the last vestiges of we're going to spend a ton of money on some top line talent because we believe in the movie. And when Joe Roth talked to the times right before the insider came out, he said, uh, in regards to selling the movie to the public, he said, it's like walking up a hill with a refrigerator on your back. The fact of the matter is we're really proud. We did this movie. People say it's the best movie they've seen this year. They say, why don't we make more movies like this? And he would get his answer because it didn't make any money. Nobody wants to go see it. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's myriad reasons for that, though. This is not... You can make a movie like this and make it differently than the way that Michael Mann made it. Sure. This is a very meditative... um, It's sophisticated, but it's like a little masturbatory in a way. Like the the style that Mann has that is beautiful when it's a movie about thieves or war, I think is maybe not as easily understood when it's about a guy sitting alone in a hotel room imagining his children. <laughs> you know, like, it's just, there's it, it, he's taking it a little bit far. I thought about this even just listening to the music in the movie. You know, man's so famous for using, like, Tangerine Dream and these really evocative, synthy, beautiful sounds. And this has almost like an opera score. Mm-hmm. You know, there's Which all the this... the woman from Dead Can Dance, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, and it's just all this kind of vocalizing. And it's meant to counteract some of the sort of, like, intense speechifying that happens in the movie. It's pretty abstract. Yeah, the differences between this and, say, Spotlight are pretty much exactly. in those things that you're talking about. That's a, and Spotlight is a movie that was a hit. Yeah. You know, it was, a, it was a, a true blue hit because it was closer to the spirit of the conclusions of All the President's Men, if not the style. Yeah. You know, All the President's Men is like a little slower, a little darker, a little harder to understand. This movie is very similar to that. Spotlight is just like, let's get the bad guys with our reporting. Yeah. And I think that's just more satisfying for people. The Insider is, is much more ambivalent. And the way that, especially with the movie, the way the movie ends with Bergman quitting his, his post, it leaves us at a little bit of cross purposes intellectually. Like what were we supposed to take away from this? That this industry is actually broken even though they did something great? That's, that's just not ultimately that's satisfying. That's why I love the last, like that final scene where Bergman's in the airport and all the people who are in the terminal with him are looking at 60 minutes, but they're not necessarily like cheering or they're just kind of like, huh, okay. And then they go back around their day and he's there and he's like, none of these people know that what I went through to get that up on a yeah. stupid television screen and JFK. Yeah. Yeah. Any other bigger thoughts on the insider before we get into the awards? Um, no, I, I, most of my stuff can hit, can be covered when we do the awards, but it, it did. I hadn't seen this movie in a long time. And uh, it was way better than I thought it yeah. was going to be. And I, and I was kind of mad at myself that I haven't jumped in on it more often because um, I think the thing I like the most about it, uh, I'll save it for what stage the best. Okay, let's take a break and then we'll come back and do the awards. No no break? No break. All right, let's get right into the awards then. So um, most rewatchable scene. We do these awards for every rewatch, rewatchables. And there's a couple 99 specific ones that we have in here for Luminary for our uh, 99 rewatchables. Most rewatchable scene, 
Lowell and Jeffrey in the car feeling each other out while it's raining and yeah. Bergman being like, you think the Knicks are going to make the semifinals? Yeah, I didn't like the semifinals. <laughs> the man needed our sports consulting services. Say, got to say conference finals for that. I, uh, the, uh, the Blazers are in the semifinals. <laughs> semifinals. They made the final four. Uh, I love the time. Tylenol story. I love when he's talking about the CEO of Tylenol and why again is like the guy... The, when 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 somebody put poison in a bottle of Tylenol, the CEO of Tylenol pulled every bottle of Tylenol off the shelves and invented the safety cap. And he's like, "That's who I want to be working for." And not because he was a businessman, because he was a man of science. Yeah, I love that scene. It's something Michael Mann has been really good at over the course of his career is putting two good actors together and have a little the chess match feeling out scene is a Michael Mann yeah. staple. Yeah. And he loves Prosky having and Khan and Thief. That's yeah, the best just, one. He, and these guys, and there's small talk, but there's a lot more going on. And he's just, that's what he loves. Um, the way that Wygand feels out, or sorry, the way Bergman feels Wygand out from the hotel room in Louisville to the, this car conversation. And you can tell he's just trying to like bring him to the point that he already wants to be at, which is like, you know, you want to talk to me. Right. I just have to create a world in which talking to me is okay. Yeah. It's a unique formulation. You have to be seductive and a bully, you know? And in that moment that you talked about earlier when he gets to the hotel room and he's like, you manipulated me. And he's just saying, I'm just, I just led you to where you wanted to mm -hmm. go. You know, this is something you always wanted to do. It's a fascinating thing. I mean, it does raise some complicated questions about what a journalist's responsibility is. You know, it's like, is it right for him to lead him to the ruin of his family's life? Every I mean, time that, though, he lets Jeffrey make the decision for himself. He does. So. Uh, Another great scene, the exposition scene where they're all eating lunch and talking about the legal defense that Brown and Williamson will put up. So like the 60 minute staff is essentially sitting around a table and it's essentially the entire movie so far has been these sort of, you know, impressionistic scenes and they're very, this is the one time where they take a step back and they're like, here's what's going on. This guy has a confidentiality agreement. We want him to get him to break it. Mike Wallace thinks we can do it this way. These two lawyers are like, you're never going to be able to do it because they're just going to sue you into, into oblivion. And he's like, that line where he's like, if Ford or Toyota and they have like a truck that blows up 12 times, like they pull the truck off the road. These guys, they're just, they never, ever quit. They yeah. never lost. They bat a thousand. Yeah. yeah. I love that scene. Um, that is just one big exposition dump. I, but I kind of like it. But it's fun. Yeah. It's really well They're written. All eating. There's people yeah. walking in front of the camera. Um, Eric Roth, who is a co-writer of this movie, is famed for his ability to clarify the problem of a movie inside of one scene. Yeah. It's like one of his the things in his reputation. He wrote Forrest Gump. He wrote A Star is Born. Um, What's the problem of Forrest? How does he distill down Forrest Gump? It's the relationship with his mom. You yeah. know, it's like the unresolved nature of his connectivity to his family and home. Set up for you to Come make on. an inappropriate joke. Come on, <laughs> um, it's the scene where he furiously masturbates, which Bill impersonated once upon a time on a podcast. Uh, Listen, the guy, you know, took a shot. <laughs> took a shot. Uh, shoot your shot, Forrest. Uh, shoot your shot. <laughs> I like that scene a lot. I do think that it is just very cleverly like getting the audience to understand what the movie's about. Yeah. Yeah, which by the way is really hard and there's a lot of people in this and there's a lot of lawyers and there's a lot of agendas and just a lot of characters and a lot of all of a sudden Gina Gershon's in there like <laughs> Love it. it's, it's just Bruce McGill. <laughs> Tobolowski's here. Yeah, there's just a ton of characters and people and It's a good example of where Joey Pants might the Joey Pants word might yeah, actually break the movie itself because you're like you can't have there's the Pepsi girl guys. in this. <laughs> this is something man's been really good at though having a combination of mostly faces I recognize so I can to identify them but then like two or three where I don't have a history with yeah. that he uses to his advantage absolutely yeah the entire Mississippi court sequence yeah so including Wygan kind of staring into the into the, the gulf uh, the gulf is that part's great and then the entire Bruce McGill wings house you know what Michael Mann must have saw the gulf and you know how he feels about bodies of water yeah. <laughs> he's like hold on a second I know this isn't in the script but Wide shot. I'm thinking wide shot. <laughs> That's what the thing is. Crow staring that way. Wide shot. Hey, can we get the sun right? You know, Joe Roth was like, you know, Michael, this is a two and a half hour film about a guy trying to make a decision about whether to break a confidentiality agreement. You think maybe we could just lose like five minutes of golf? Yeah, and Michael Mann's like, like, no. Get the fuck out of my screen. Nah, he you know, repeats you know it later on with Pacino when he's on vacation on the beach and he's just staring out into the ocean thinking about whether or not he should pick up his cell phone. It's <laughs> so good. Nobody likes to watch out of water like Michael Mann. Um, and then the other two, these are kind of basically one half of, e of a scene each, but Bergman discovering the CBS Westinghouse sale and confronting Hewitt 
and Wallace and Wallace being like, I'm with Don on this one. You know, and that, that whole moment. shocking moment. And just him like. Not covered in um, Mike Wallace's hair, that documentary. <laughs> that was excellent. Yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah, I mean, you definitely could have played that up as a, a low moment for Mike Wallace. I love the sequence where Wallace visits Pacino at 5.30 in the, in in the, the morning. Room. Yeah. yeah, he's like, no, I love, I was just awake in my pajamas. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but right. just everything that, Wa- and and this documentary that Bill's talking about, which I, is not out yet and is out later this summer. It's great. Um, it's called Mike Wallace is Here. It's all archival footage of Wallace from his, throughout his entire career. And I think it actually informs this scene a lot because there was a lot about Wallace that I didn't know about. Mm. And I don't know if this is a time to talk about sure, Mike Wallace, absolutely. but I didn't really realize that he was kind of a sh- like sticky broadcaster before he was a newsman. And he has this fierce and legendary reputation as somebody who got, he went toe to toe with some of the biggest international figures in the Ayatollahs world. Ayatollahs and yeah, stuff. Yeah, thieves yeah. in suits, he says in the, in the movie. And, you know, he also was like a showman. You know, he was a guy who was trying to be famous. He was yeah. trying to be on TV in the 1950s. And you can see where Plummer's character is kind of like reckoning with what his legacy is. And he, he's kind of saying, like, I fought really hard to be a credible person. And if you kill CBS and CBS News, I'm going to lose that. And I'm going to be partially responsible for that. And I don't want that. And obviously, he comes around at the end. But that is like an, an example of somebody explaining their life and career again in a way that is like subtle yeah. and interesting and moves the story forward. Well, on the flip side of that, the other rewatchable scene I have is um, when Don Hewitt and Bergman have it out at the end. You fucked us! No! You fucked you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But Don't even learn stuff. <laughs> unleashed. I love that moment. It they was took a, the they took the collar off him in that scene. Yeah. Uh, also, fun extra concept con like little extra thing because of what happened to Don Hewitt. Yeah. I, I mean that, that he's was a gonna, villain in this movie, and then it's like, oh, he. You know, guess what? I was saving that for what's really the worst. Villain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's prescient though. You know, yeah. like he comes off very poorly, and Philip Baker Hall. You know, great great performance as a. Kind of the arch villain of the movie. Even. I don't think Philip Baker Hall maybe knew who he was playing no, at the no, time, no. but yeah. I have one more re- one more rewatchable scene mm-hmm. that I just think is really well done, and I like scenes like this just in general. When he goes to play golf, and the guys in the you suit, knew, you know that we were going to talk like, about that. <laughs> the guys in the suit just hitting really nice swing. By yeah, the way, and that I, other guy, I completely agree. Staring him down after each swing, and just it's just creepy. And I think movies like this have to have that one scene where. It, the the main character realizes the, he's either being followed. I'm in too deep. His life has yeah. changed. His life's in danger. That's the Redford it's hearing so good. footsteps scene in all the presidents. And then he's finally in the car and the guy's just staring him down and finally he just grabs the five iron and comes out of his car. Yeah. I love that three minutes. Do you think that guy was cast for his swing? Because that is a smooth swing he's got. I think it's a combo. I think they probably, uh, it's a face swing combo. Yeah. I don't I, think that was one of those I learned how to swing in three Crow weeks. Yeah. did. I don't think Crow golfed, though. He doesn't look like he golfs to me. Yeah, that seemed... Well, it good. doesn't help that he's wearing loafers. On he's the got scale a little bit of 1 to 10 of, like, Matt Damon and Bagger Vance is a 1, <laughs> and Costner and Tin Cup is a 10. Yeah. Like, Crow's like, Crow's a, like a 4. 4, I agree. <laughs> the, the, the other guy, though, that guy was like a 9.5. Yeah, cranking that's, it. That's like Kepka. Really nice. Like, yeah, he really did. It was like Crushing Brooks, it. Brooks Kepka. Down Broadway. <laughs> um, what did you guys think the most rewatchable scene was? I like the one that I nominated. The The... Wallace confronts uh, Lowell Bergman at 5 30 in the morning. In the real world, when you get to where I am, there are other considerations. Like what? Corporate responsibility? Well, are we talking celebrity here? I, I'm not talking celebrity, vanity, CBS. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about when you're near the end of your life in the beginning. Actually, you know what? I take it back. It has to be the Gulf and, uh, and Bruce McGill. Yeah. Bruce McGill snapping and but that's yeah. but that's what, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you don't get to instruct anything around here this is not north carolina not south carolina nor kentucky this is the sovereign state of mississippi's proceeding wipe that smirk off your face that, that is that is like the emotional turning point of the movie too yeah. that's when you think the good guys are going to start to win it's also just such a flex for man because he's like i know i could have just made this entire movie about this court courtroom like we could have just made a courtroom drama that would have stand like stood up to a Grisham movie but is Pacino in that scene enough he's not no he just he's in the I feel like Pacino has to be in the scene I like when Pacino finally when he gets unleashed with with the Pacino in same scenes with Christopher Plummer are my favorite scenes in this movie so I would would pick probably the one when 
What does he say in that scene when he gets mad? This news division has been vilified in the New York Times, in print, on television, for caving the corporate The New York Times ran a blow by blow of what we talked about behind closed doors. You fucked us. No, you fucked you. Don't invert stuff. Big Tobacco tried to smear Wigand. You bought it. And it's funny because, all right, I guess we knew him. What's age the best? I'll wait. Well, I was just going to say, what's age, what's age the best? So let's give it to the Pacino Unleashed is re- most rewatchable scene. Then what's age the best? I, I have Pacino's performance. Yeah, for me, this is what I was going to say earlier. I, obviously an incredible actor and really good at how he can kind of scale it back or whatever, but he has this quality that I don't, I can't think of any other actor who does this because he does it in heat too. When he's trying to get something out of the other person and the way he's like super comfortable oh my God. and playing off the guy and it seems completely natural. Like he's not acting at all and he's having a conversation, but there's this whole ulterior motive the whole time and you can see it and he's measuring the guy and he clearly wants to get to some destination, but he's playing the long game. I've never seen another actor do that, and he does that really well in this movie. Like, the the way he kind of plays off Crow mm-hmm. the whole time, even in the fucking first scene of the Ayatollah, or whoever that guy was, the terrorist, and he's got a bag over his head. He's doing that scene. We the can't shake. even see his yeah. face. I know. Yeah. But he's just, nobody was ever better at that. He's amazing. The way he processes information on screen without being too showy about it, it you think every actor does that? He does it a lot in Godfather 2. Maybe they don't. You know, yeah. Godfather 2 is when he first like, but then over the course of his career, I feel like, see love, that's basically the whole movie. He's trying to figure out if this lady that he's falling for is actually like killing Yeah, the idea of watching and listening and thinking in character yeah. is that kind of high level. I don't know who, who else like does that. Mm, that's a Denzel of- thing is very good at that too. People think yeah. of think of the actors who are the Daniel best, the best screen partners. The people who, when you're watching them have a conversation, the person isn't necessarily dominating. They are receiving and giving. It's actually, I feel like Hawk talked about this a little bit when he was on your show yeah. about Denzel. And there are certain people who kind of come to play, and Pacino knows when to go big and he knows when to pull back. And I think it, there's probably a little bit of being good in the theater too about this because you need to gesture, you need to be, you need to make it clear that you're doing something without talking. I don't know. I, I I can't you can't underestimate putting Crow and Pacino in the room together. Like that's just especially at that time, they're both so talented as screen actors mm-hmm. that you're just gonna get something good every time they're together. The Crow thing bums me out. This performance, Proof of Life, Gladiator, Beautiful Mind. I love Master and Commander. LA Confidential. Did you see Boy Erased? What He's, year was that? Last year. He was really good in it. It yeah. was a reminder of like, oh, sometimes. You oh, can, I you, did see Boy Erased. He can be the most charismatic person yeah. in the world. You know, he's playing like a schlubby pastor father, but yeah, he's that really, was good. really he's good, good in the movie. Yeah. So we have Pacino's performance. I had the cinematography and the look and feel of the movie, like just the visual style. And then the golf. Now, I have the golf. This is interesting. And the golf. Yeah. Just, just watching the waves. Wide shot of the golf. And then maybe at a first for the rewatchables, I would say I have a nominee that for what's aged the best which is also aged the worst which Mm. is the inner workings of 60 Minutes and CBS News and the corporate culture there obviously if you like watching like how shit gets put together movies yeah it's fascinating it's fascinating to watch the the internal politics and the wrangling and the pushing and pulling and edit it so that it looks like this and get me this and somebody dial this footage up and then on the flip side knowing what we know now this was a pretty morally corrupt place to work. Well, we got to say that though. What, do we have other what's age the best though? That's what I had. The 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 three, the Pacino, add, the cinematography and the inner workings. I would add for minutes. what's age the best and this is purely a result of time passing. Plumber now is Mike Wallace. I don't have the Mike Wallace history as much because Mike Wallace isn't in my life every day. Like if you're, if somebody did this movie right now and Christopher Plummer's playing like, I don't know, Tony Kornheiser. Yeah. I wouldn't be able to like separate Tony Kornheiser from Christopher Plummer. Yeah. (laughs) But Mike Wallace hasn't been on TV in 15 years. So now when I'm watching this, it's just Christopher Plummer's interpretation of Mike Wallace, which is so much more fun to watch. I completely agree. And the thing that is cool about that performance is, and he was, this was recognized at the time. He is capturing what Wallace does on screen. I was thinking about this, having just seen the documentary. Yeah. There's a thing that Wallace does where he holds, when he's asking a question, he holds his fingers together and 
kind of emphasizes and mm-hmm. points. And Plummer is doing that. He's he's getting the posture and the execution, but he's not doing a Mike Wallace impression. No. He doesn't have all this prosthetics on. He doesn't have his hair dyed that like jet matte black that Wallace always had. Like right. he, he is just doing Christopher Plummer interpreting Mike Wallace and so it just it works really well and then he becomes the Mike little Wallace. smile yeah. uh, just where like, like that like, super charismatic confident but I'm also at any point I could start yelling at you kind of vibe yes. I thought he was just that incredible that moment when they're talking about how they would try to get him on screen and Wallace is like you know this would be like if an airline started like you would you would take if somebody was a whistleblower on an airline you would bring that out because it was about a public health issue and they're like well it doesn't matter because of this this and the other thing and he just like sits back and takes a sip out of a CBS sports mug. And I was like, fuck yeah. That's such a great little bit. Nice you know? touch. Nice little detail. Well, so best supporting actor. If we were to do 99. Yeah. I mean, this is like a catastrophe. Tell me. Cruz and Magnolia, I'm good with. Jude Law and Talented Mr. Ripley, I'm actually good at good with. I thought great. he was He's, incredible. Great in that performance. Movie. Haley Joel Osment in the sixth sense. That's a rough one. Uh, I mean, he's good. <laughs> that That's also a movie that doesn't work if Haley Joel Osment's not good. Michael Clark Duncan in The Green Mile. Uh, that's brutal. a rough one. Brutal. And then the winner was Michael Caine in The Cider House Rules. Now, that was just one of those like fucking weird. I just feel like Plummer is, is better in this movie than basically everyone in that category except Jude Law and Mr. Ripley. Jude Law's... Yeah. I don't know who else could have played that part and he's so charismatic in that. I don't know. But he Plummer at least is in the top five. It would be kind of fun to do a pod that's just the 1999 Oscars, but we just re re-nominate and re reaward it. Maybe at the end of this series. Yeah. I mean, I would I would probably go with Cruz too. But the thing that happens here with Michael Caine, where he wins for Cider House after being passed over many times yeah, over the it years, was the Susan Lucci thing. He, but for Christopher Jaws Plummer three. got yeah. that later on in his career for Beginners. Like, is Beginners Christopher Plummer's ab- absolute best performance? No, but they gave it to him because it's like, this guy was in The Sound of Music. This guy was in The Insider. Well, you know, they, he's in a lot of great films. There's another Oscar catastrophe. Sean Penn got nominated for Sweet and Low Down. Pacino not nominated at all. I know. I know. That's outrageous. Do you think it was like after Set of Women? I think they people were, just were like, tired of him. We're, we're yeah. good. That's outrageous. Uh, okay, so uh, what's aged? That's what's aged Can the I best. give you one more Christopher Plummer stat? Yeah, sure. Can you guess what year he was born? He's got to be 90 years old. Chris, want to guess a year? 42. 1942, what are you saying? I would say if he's 90, it's 29 or 30. 1929. Yeah. He turns 90 in December. How is, like, I honestly so can't even conceive of In this movie, old. he's <laughs> almost 70. But he was just in that, what was the the movie where, uh, the John, the Getty movie? Oh, he was, uh, oh, the he in the world. Spacey. Yeah. Spacey. So he was 88 when he did that, and he was really good. I was going to say he's also awesome yeah. in that movie. Yeah. Oh my god! I just hope I can even like speak it. There was 80. a lot of talk when he won for beginners. I mean, he was like 83 when he won for beginners. You know. Yeah. That was part of the reason why I think people were like, "Wow." I mean, I'm good with you that. know. He's literally one of the greatest actors of the 20th century, and then also won his Oscar in the 21st century. Right. Uh, what's aged the best? Let's give it to Plummer. What's aged the worst? I like I said, the inner workings of 60 Minutes. It. Doesn't yeah. even, it never suggests anything untoward, although you could reread the uh, interactions with Gina Gershon's lawyer as sort of indicative of the of the chauvinistic behavior that that happened there. We, weirdly, we've wound up talking about CBS News a couple of times this year because of broadcast news mm-hmm. and Susan Zarinsky and everything. But yeah, anything else aged the worst for you guys in this oh, movie? I have a couple. Okay. By the way, Christopher Plummer never nominated for an Oscar before 2010. For the last station? Yeah. Yeah. The ending, the tail end of the ending really bothers me. I wish somebody had talked Michael Mann out of it. The the slow motion, Pacino leaving the, going on the street <laughs> and it slows down. Like all of a sudden we're making a movie in 1981. Yeah. And it's just bad. It's it's fine if, if you don't know any better in the 70s, but this is like, hey, cool. Let's try this slow motion thing. It's just kind of tacky. The movie's so well crafted. I just didn't understand. You it. almost like half expect like the Doogie Howser music to start playing. Yeah, it's just it's just <laughs> hacky. Dun, 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 dun. It's bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with Bill. I'm I'm not a big fan of the score, as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, the score could have been better. He he, man, in an attempt to be 
singular, sometimes ages himself. And I think his movies are beautiful, but they are, you can feel him straining for individuality at times. Is this your, is this a subtle dig at Linkin Park, Jay-Z being used in Miami Vice? It's the same thing. It's an attempt to capture something popular Mm -hmm. and also abstract and like it just often doesn't work for me at all. It's one of the only things in his movies that I, and I'm not like I'm not into those Tangerine Dream soundtracks. Like I I don't actually understand. I know what he's doing, where it's like something beautiful and like, um, uh, like like a sunshine compared to darkness. Mm-hmm. But it, that stuff just never works for me. Um, I I have another. What's age the worst? Um, Wings Hauser is like prominently in this movie for 12 minutes. <laughs> that means you don't talk. <laughs> It was just a weird <laughs> casting. Like at that point in his career, he he was, you know, he was like Jonesy on nine hundred two and zero when yeah. Dylan McKay needed to get yeah. his money back. Yeah. and it's like now he's in this Michael Mann movie. It's and pretty amazing. Once you're Jonesy in nine hundred two and zero, I but can't I think have Michael you Mann in the probably insider. saw like tough guys don't dance and was just like that guy. Let's get him in Wings the insider. Hauser. I mean, there's a lot of people Somebody feel that way about Bruce McGill. Yeah. You know, Bruce McGill is always going to be Animal House. You know, and and yeah. in this movie, he is like moral certitude yeah. and lawyerly power. Well, in Bruce McGill's defense, he's unleashing one of the great that guy runs anyone's ever had in the nineties. Where's he's he at? in I'm j I'm God, his IMDB is so fucking long. I'm he works. Through it Bruce for, McGill works. He's my cousin Vinny, Cliffhanger, A Perfect World, Time Cop, Courage Under Fire, Rosewood. Eh, not that good. All can right, I sorry. give you the I overrated him. Can I give you the titles of the five movies that precede the insider for Wings Hauser. Mm-hmm. I, I'm sure they're terrible. Are they mostly Skinamax movies? Tales from the Hood. Uh huh. Guns and Lipstick. Broken Bars. Original Gangsters. And Life Among the Cannibals. Yeah. That's yeah. where he was at. He was fucking Jonesy in 1994. It was like a last gas. Yeah. Yeah, it's tough. Somebody called in sick, I think. Uh, on the flip side, though, I should have had this for What's Age the Best. Lindsay Krauss, one of my favorite Amazing. random actresses. Um, House of Cards, yeah. She's the verdict. Yeah. Slap shot. She's kind of in the mix, but you never know what her name is. I guess we could have done her for uh, the Joey Pants, but she's just playing a normal character in this one. And it's also funny that Pacino has a normal marriage in this yeah, movie, which might a, be the only time ever. That's a good point. Uh, Bergman's wife is a celebrated documentarian. Actually, yeah. that's who she's playing. Yeah. Yeah. The Al Pacino marriage slash relationship. <laughs> it's not. It's usually complicated. Sorry if the chicken got it. <laughs> Overcooked. Maybe <laughs> I was gonna say maybe the uh <laughs> Kate Corleone's abortion might have been the nadir. Yeah. But see a love, maybe not knowing if Diane his girlfriend Vanora was trying to kill him. Having to screw Diane Xander Vanora heat. or whoever she's yeah. screwing to get closure with him. To get, to I don't, heat. Remind me, how, where Tough. do you guys stand on speaking of Pacino Paramours, Diane Venora in general? So I was shocked to see her in this movie. I'd forgotten. And she's got the long hair compared and to the, heat, with the short yeah. hair. And but that same kind of sad, I shouldn't be with this guy look, which yeah. maybe Michael Mann just wanted to run that back. It's, but she's just doing a sequel to the heat. She's character. doing heat with long hair. Yeah. She's like a really good Shakespearean actress. Yeah. And that's just sort of the, one of the things with Michael Mann movies and with like law. If you, you know, I, I was more aware of this when I lived in New York, but you would see an episode of Law and Order, there'd be some manager of a gap folding t-shirts and be like, I don't know how that guy died. And <laughs> right. then like you'd be walking down the street and he'd be starring in Richard the Third and mm-hmm. Shakespeare in the park. Right. <laughs> it would just be kind of, okay, everybody's got to work. She never really did anything that big again though. I mean, that's kind of why I ask. I, I can't really think of an, another significant Diane Venora performance, but at the time she'd been in Romeo and Juliet. Mm-hmm. She was, uh, I think Juliet's mother. Mm-hmm. And obviously Heat. Yeah. And there was, the feeling like, oh, Diane Venora, she's yeah. like a very- It's Venora season. Venora season, yeah. yeah. by 2004, she was in Law and Order Special Victims Unit. Yeah. Michael uh, Mann saw something special. Let's talk a little bit about the 1999 award for the most 1999 move- moment in this movie. Okay. I have Pacino and Crow faxing back and forth. Yeah, Amazing. the faxing was where I was going Incredible. mentally. Just the sheer amount of business Pacino conducts from payphones. Yeah. Where he's like, you meet me in this diner. You know, like just a lot of like coordinating, getting his messages. He has a cell phone, but he still uses pay phones. Also, the New York Times in the lobby, nobody would do that now. I just like, I'll be on my cell phone in the lobby. Every once in a while, I think about the fact that when I, when I was in Ireland for six months in 98, in the beginning of 99, actually, I, 
the only way I communicated with my parents is to call from a payphone in a dorm building in, in Cork, Ireland. And I was in another country and there was no incoming phone number. So I would just like pick it up and I have like my AT&T card and I would dial and say, hey, I'm, I'm fine. Just talk to you next week. And that's just like so wild to imagine that like at, I think I was 19. That was like how my parents were like our 19 year old son. We can't call him. And that was 20 years ago. <laughs> I remember going to Italy in 04 with Jimmy and Adam and Sal and all those guys. And we just had no connection to the yeah. outside world. And we went downtown in Rome one day and Sal and I were at the, at the, there was this place that had an internet thing and we were like so starved for sports information, <laughs> anything, <laughs> paying this thing, like trying to get on ESPN.com even for an hour. Like it, you could really be cut off. I think that's impossible now. I, I don't know, unless you were on like a safari in Africa or something, I don't know how you'd be cut off like that. Yeah, I mean, I, any payphone stories for you? No, I mean, the th <laughs> my age specifically. I think I got my first cell phone in 1999, and I was still in yeah. high school, yeah. and that was like a turning point. And then within five years, everyone had a cell phone. Yeah, you never. I mean, payphones started to vanish in New York around what 2005, something like something that. something like that. Yeah, and uh, it is. It definitely marks. It really marks the time. I mean, the thing that I was thinking of that hasn't aged that well is just the sort of general concern about corporate influence on the news media. Yeah like that's that argument is like over and done with yeah. it's not a good thing it's just like no one is concerned about that now because every major news outlet is owned has a corporate parent yeah espn went through this with the frontline thing when they killed the nfl mm -hmm. that was like their version of this this was obviously th a million thousand times more important but the even there was probably more outrage for that than there was for this mm -hmm. because we had more 15 years later way more the other thing that's pretty outrage. funny is that now we would have like you know thumb drives and you know, leaked emails and a bunch of other stuff. This, like, Lowell Bergman just gets the SEC filing and it's like, turns out you're going to make $3 million from this sale. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, any other 1999 things specifically, 1999 awards? Or was I it think just faxing? 60 minutes mattering like it did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is kind of the last decade that, that it was that important. Okay. Once uh, we get to the 2000s, then you got more channels and just more things yeah, going like on. Vice News. Yeah. Really just Vice like News. <laughs> Honestly, I think and we hit on this a little bit already, but just the acceptance of cigarettes in our lives. I think mm. now if you meet a young person who smokes cigarettes, they're kind of regarded as an alien. Like it's just a, it's increasingly uncommon and then I try to hire them. Yeah. Is that an LA thing though? <laughs> it might be. I mean, that's only my experience at this moment, but even in New York I was surprised. I was very rarely going out to have a smoke with my younger friends. It was always with my older friends. He says with his eyebrows arched, staring at me. <laughs> well, it's just because you know they were like, you know, the David Shoemakers of the world. Yeah. I would. Ha you could have a cigarette with somebody like that. Couldn't have a cigarette with the editorial assistant working at the magazine who was twenty one because that person was like on a paleo diet. You know, crushing the gym four nights a week. <laughs> yeah, now you'd get like a ginger shot. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So wanna, that's that. That's just very go uh, get a turmeric shot with me. <laughs> Rather have get some ginger in. The only other ninety nine. Craig, Craig's thing. like now you're speaking my language. <laughs> yeah. This is my generation. Do a lot of your friends smoke cigarettes? No, mm. um, it's just not a thing. Yeah, good for them. All of Craig's friends are non smoking virgins. <laughs> <laughs> wow, tough beat for my friends. <laughs> for your friends, that's yeah, right. Not me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the only other 99 thing I would mention is the offhanded reference to Ken Starr. Oh, yeah. That was really good. Yeah. Ken Starr's firm. That was good. Clinton gets mentioned at some point in this movie, right? I think so. President Clinton. Yeah, something I think like so. That. Yeah. Casting what ifs, there's not that many. Just Val Kilmer was up for Wigand, which is a pretty significant what if for this podcast, but it speaks to your sort of like, you know, Kilmer kind of leaving a lot on the table in this decade. Did Russell Crowe market correct Val Kilmer? I think it's fair to, I think Val Kilmer market corrected it himself, mm -hmm. but I think Russell Crowe showed what Val Kilmer's career could have been. Yeah. Yeah. Kilmer has had so many opportunities to just be like, great, I got myself a new lane. I'm going to stick with it. I got to say from, my biggest- from Top Gun and Willow and being like, I can be a movie yeah. star, but not. And then Heat, where it's like, you could just be like the cool third guy in every tough guy movie. But then he was still Batman and yeah. The Saint. Yeah. My biggest casting what if is what if somebody had never said, hey, we should get Wings Hauser. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I, I think Wings Hauser's good in this movie. He yeah. is. I'm, I'm it's like, just so I, weird. Like, that like, like, he, like like, he doesn't deserve it. Is what you're It'd saying? It'd be like if like the situation from Jersey Shore was <laughs> one true. of the lawyers. Jesus Christ, <laughs> that's that's overstating. Um, here's my half-ass internet research. Yeah, uh, this was originally called Man of the People. I like the insider better. Uh, Eric- I actually, I still don't think they. I think the right title really could have helped this movie. I think cigarette smoking something should have been. It, it, the the title's not sinister enough. Like, do you think if it was called Tonight on sixty Minutes, was that an original title? No, I'm just throwing. I'm coming up with some alt. I'm trying to come up with a punny title. You know, it's like cigarette burns, something like that. You'd, you'd want you'd want to come up with something or like, like burned. Right. It just needed to it have an element of danger to yeah. it. Yeah. That the insiders yeah. could be anything. That sounds like it could be a- hazardous to your health. Nice. Yeah. The true story. Colon, the true story. <laughs> yeah. Like Jason Reitman's Thank You for Not Smoking. Um, Really good title. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and told me what the movie was about. The insider, I don't know what it's about. Or Thank You for Smoking. What if, it was it, just called the, for- what if it was called The Whistleblower? That would have been good. That would have been fine. Or a whistleblower. That yeah. was like a whistle. civil action. Yeah. It's called civil. But then yeah. Aaron Brockovich was just Aaron Brockovich. Uh, so it was originally called Man of the People. Roth and Mann wrote the first draft of the screenplay at the Broadway Deli in Santa Monica, at mm. the bar of the Broadway Deli. Never been there, but I think it would be pretty awesome if you walked in one day and two guys were writing the insider at the bar. Is there a reason why we didn't do this podcast from the Broadway Deli? That's I, fucking weird. Yeah. I can see one person writing a screenplay, but two people they next to each just, other like, writing a screenplay? Jamming it out. Couldn't have been at a bar. Must have been at a table. This is like Chris and I talking NBA coverage here at the Ringer. Just right. jamming it out of the deli. What if we wow. did this? Smoking at each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, Russell Crowe was not able to talk to Jeffrey Wygant about his experiences because Wygant was still bound by the confidentiality agreement that he had signed with Brandon Williamson. Mm. You know, he was able to break it for court, but not for Russell Crowe. Uh, Mike Wallace detested this movie. Michael Mann I wonder why. was living in the same Central Park West building as Don Hewitt during filming. Hmm. And Hewitt had been criticizing the movie in page six throughout the production. One day they met in the elevator and Mann introduced himself. Hewitt took a second and then, according to Mann, threw his arm around him and said, that fucking little Bergman. That was Don Hewitt. Uh, Bergman is currently the chair of the investigative reporting department uh, and the graduate school of journalism. And Don Hewitt hit on Michael Mann's wife. <laughs> yeah. At UC Berkeley and is a producer on Frontline and Pete Hamill, famous New York Daily News journalist, famous New York gadfly, plays yeah. the New York Times writer who Lowell Bergman leaks the story to. That's right. Pete Hamill, my my grandmother's favorite columnist, longtime reader of the Daily News. Yeah. Grew up loving Pete Hamill. So that's a, that's a, that's the Good internet writer. research. Let's go to... Uh, I had one more. Oh, do you? I thought there was a... Uh, there was something where Jeffrey Wagan didn't want any cigarettes in yes, the movie. That's Because I actually looked this up. That's true. It's it's always hard for me to believe when Pacino's not smoking, smoking in a movie. They're smoking in the Middle East, though. Right, but I I just think Pacino should smoke in every movie because yeah. I think he's as soon as they say, "All right, that's a cut," Pacino's just got like the Marlboro Reds out. Um, in this character, felt like he should have smoked, and I think it would have been an interesting wrinkle. But somebody in this movie should have smoked. Uh, smoking's he, banned want, in offices by ninety nine, though. Right? Yes, but it's like you, you want the you want people thinking about cigarettes during the movie. I actually think it was a mistake not to have more kind of cigarettes and smoke and just it's kind of hanging over everything. Yeah. I don't know. Well, what do you guys think about that general concern about portraying smoking in movies as being influential and encouraging people to use cigarettes? I mean, I definitely think it's a factor. For sure. That's you don't think so. No, 100%. Yeah, I think, yeah. I think. I, smoking cuz it just makes you look cool. cool I, I've shit. been in yeah. Yeah. conversations about who is the coolest smoker of all time in a movie. Yeah. Was it Wings Hauser? No, who's the one who used to smoke like this? Make you work? No, there's a guy. <laughs> I got to go find. I have a whole email thread about this with my friends from like 7 years ago. Sounds the like ones good content. Who can pull off who had this say but then they they go here like this. Yeah. And do it that way, which is really hard to do and just is Instead awkward. Instead of going with your two fingers yeah, they don't like do that, this way. they would go they like that. This. Yeah. Oh, Don Johnson in Miami Vice. Also, that Best is also smoker of um, all time. De Niro in Goodfellas does that a lot. Another good one. Yeah. Do you think that's a direction that comes directly from man? If we do a pod breakout for this, I want a lot of Don Johnson having a fucking cigarette <laughs> with a white jacket on. Great. Yeah, I think it's really hard because we've also seen movies... Or TV shows where somebody's clearly not a smoker and they're trying to smoke and it's super awkward. Yeah. Like Cruz. I don't know if Cruz has ever smoked a cigarette in I a movie. I don't think so. 
But if he ever did, he I guarantee it would be terrible. American made, and I don't think he does. Oh, yeah. Um, By the way, I watched Eyes Wide Shut the last hour of it recently. Oh, my God. I don't know what's going to happen. Especially when we do that if it's one. this hot in the studio when we do it. It's going to be so weird when we do this. I'm just going to be wearing a, a giant mask and no clothes. <laughs> so it should be exciting. Cruz goes. <laughs> Cruz goes to the coroner to see if if the the dead girl from the party's there and she's just dead naked on a thing and Cruz starts leaning over like he's going to kiss her. <laughs> I was like, what is going on? How are we going to do a podcast about this movie? This movie's insane. It's too late. You've already committed us. Yeah. Movie, that movie's insane. Imagine the Twitter breakouts for that one. We know? might have to like drink during that podcast. That'd be fun. Um, Dion Waiters Award. Oh, wow. I, th- I personally think this is a wow. one nominee award. Wow. Boy, you got rights and lefts, ups and downs and middles. So what? This is not North Carolina. This is not South Carolina, nor Kentucky. This is the sovereign state of Mississippi's proceeding. Now you wipe that smirk off your face. That's like his only line in the movie. It's, it's Bruce McGill. That was very good. Thank He's you. also <laughs> the winner good. of the uh, of the Saul Rubin Award. <laughs> yes, that, we it's a double winner, too. and he might also win the Joey Pants. So I we think you can make the argument three. that he wins the triple crown. He dials it up, and he that. goes waiters Rubin pants. Can we talk runners up? Wipe your smirk off sure. the off your face is one Wipe of the all time dial it up. Do you think Michael Mann was like huddling with the assistant director, like? Should we tell Bruce to do one more take? And no, he bring was like, down? don't cut. <laughs> Great. Good job, Bruce. For somebody who's into all of these subtle artistic choices. He loves a ham. Man loves a ham. Yeah. He loves a ham. He loves somebody just going for it. In Ali, there's people just going for it left and right. Public enemies, they're going for it. Collateral, the whole Tom Cruise performance, he's going for it. He just loves that. Do you think he showed Bruce... Uh, She's got a great ass and you've got your head all the way up yeah. it before the courtroom scene. He's like, look, you do what you want, but this is what I was thinking. He, he, I think he showed him that Just and he was like, really dialed up. consider that a one. I want you at a seven. <laughs> I want to know what it says in the script. Does it say McGill's character l- l- blows his top? Right. Like, and is it based on the actual deposition or was this an invention? Because there are things in this movie that are invented. Sure. We don't know necessarily exactly what they are, but I'd be curious to know how that actually played out. Right. Um, anybody else for Deanne runner Waiters? Runner-up Deanne Waiters. There's Hauser? some runner-ups. Michael Gambon. Oh, yeah. Which one was that? He's that's the just like how Brandon Michael Williamson Gambon CEO, always is. Thomas Sandifer. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I would also throw in the uh, the amazing golfer uh, henchman guy. <laughs> sure. <It's> incredible. Uh, <laughs> sure. What about um, Stephen Tobolowsky as CBS Eric News Cluster? President Coward Eric Cluster? Yeah, he was good. He was good. That was a good Joey Pants one, too. So I'm going to go McGill for Dion Waiters. Unintentional comedy. I had uh, just the, the golf driving range. It was just really funny to me. Just those two guys dr- golfing in suits. I found Russell Crowe swing. Maybe in the 90s, funny. that was more common for guys to come after work and go hit some balls. But now you just go to the driving range and everybody is, looks like Jason Day. So I, it's sort of <laughs> weird to imagine some guy in a suit. There's nobody there. Yeah. I have uh, Gina Gershon as a high-powered Helen corporate Campanelli. lawyer. Yeah. I just kept expecting her to um, try to seduce somebody or she just didn't have the gravitas for me as an actress. This is somebody who's made a certain set of choices over her career. Yeah, this is That if you're now buying me as the corporate lawyer, I'm just not buying it. I liked it as counterintuitive casting. I enjoyed it. It certainly was counterintuitive. I enjoyed it. Um, I think that could have been a really good... I am too, but not as not as a hard hitting uh, corporate lawyer. Gershon's performance in Curb Your Enthusiasm is one of the top five TV comedy performances ever. Wow, that's my take. Okay. Um, any other unintentional comedy moments for you? Um, Besides Wygan and low golf. I'm throwing in the scene when he's in the hotel room and he's staring in the wall and it like oh and it melts and he's seeing his kids yeah. playing in the beach. I both liked it and also thought, I was like, wow, I wonder if anyone tried to talk man out of this. This is so corny. There's no such thing. There's no such it's thing as so talking corny. man out of it. That's why we get the good stuff and that's why we get yeah. the bad stuff. I think that, I think if you look closely at the movie, it's a little hard to take the emotional stakes as seriously because everybody in this movie is so rich. Like, Lowell Bergman, as a wow. longtime producer of Class 60 Warrior. Minutes, is so rich and he's like in his beach house, like no. arguing about the sanctity of the news. And fucking Don Hewitt, who's a multi, multi millionaire, Mike Wallace, who's one of the most famous broadcasters in American history, the guys at Brown and Williams, and Jeffrey Wigand, who, you it's know, you literally admitted he took them, but he took the money yeah. and worked at huge corporations. Like, this is not quite the 
like from the ground up struggle, you know, it's, it it is just a lot of rich people fighting over industry and it's interesting, but I think that Michael Mann is like crusading, but he's crusading for like a pretty white collar endeavor. Thanks for your, (laughs) thanks for your input. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Just saying, you know, you shame the movie. Yeah. I like, I was like, I'm on a, they made me go on vacation. I'll be in the Hamptons at my <laughs> beach house that's on the water. Yeah. I think he's in the Keys, right? Or the Keys, he, wherever or he Or Jamaica? Went. I don't even know where he's. Who where the is fuck he? knows? Whatever 60 what Minutes can buy you. Um, okay, unintentional comedy. Unanswerable questions. My big one was, how would this have played in the internet era? Like, if the, I mean, I think we've seen that in the last couple of years, especially how these stories get manipulated, how people lose interest in them in about six hours, mm-hmm. how the thing that you think is the most important thing you've ever seen gets dwarfed by something the next day. Um, our brains, our, our, our sort of senses are kind of dull at this point, I think. Given the way that everything in the news media and social media gets immediately stratified and kind of bifurcated, do you think that there would have been like a strong contingent of people who were like, cigarettes rule? And then there would have been like a whole No, it would have, but it would that, have been people like being like, no, duh. Hmm. No, duh. Everybody knows this. Christian Slater, really good smoker. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Oh, and Heather's especially, yeah. Just I'm gonna keep pump, the rest of the pot. Did he smoke and pump up the volume too? I think oh, yeah. so, yeah. Oh yeah. But I agree with you. I wonder if there would have been what would be the, the what would be the take on Jeffrey Wygand? Yeah, somebody would be like, I honor agreements yeah. as an American. Yeah, L- like contracts are important. Yeah. <laughs> um, picking nits, you could say the same. I mean, I think we've really picked a lot of nits already. But did you guys have any specific ones you wanted to hit that we haven't already? Should I talk about class again? <laughs> Democratic Socialist Podcasting with Sean Fennessy. Um, I for me the a nitpick is just the wife was out on him pretty fast. Yeah, hmm. this is a great corner for you. I love I love when you're like the mar- the marriage counselor. Stand by your man. Yeah, <laughs> it seemed okay in the beginning, Wait, or maybe it, it wasn't okay. Was but it he's... broadcast news that you were like mad that Holly Hunter wouldn't go to the dinner with him or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just you also didn't believe that she actually had a boyfriend at the end of the movie. <laughs> No, I think she died single. Um, <laughs> she's still alive. She just took she's over the president CBS. of CBS News, the Susan Zarinsky. That's the, the real life character. The character in that movie never settled down. Okay. Um, Jesus Christ. I'm just saying, I died alone. I had a lot of cats, though, like seven cats. Died alone. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, why is this a bad thing? I don't think she found. I don't think she found love. Sorry, You're, too crazy. <laughs> Go ahead. What, what do you think about Diane? About Wygan's wife and not sticking Comes by home, him. Comes home, it's like, I lost There's my- There's a bullet in the mailbox because this guy no, wants I'm to- I'm going back earlier. Comes back, I lost my job. I got laid off out of nowhere. She's not on his side. She turns on him like really quickly. It's You're like, right. what's going on here? Yeah. There, isn't your reaction like, oh, that sucks. Man, you put a lot of time in that company. She's just me like, what are we going to do? I do think- So maybe it was a bad marriage to start. We get the impression that Jeffrey Wygand has some- um, social struggles and some anger issues, yeah. which it's alluded to. Yeah, his communication yeah. is poor. Jeffrey Wagon, good hang, bad hang, <laughs> <laughs> tough hang with Jeffrey Wagon. What is it? Tough, great hang, tough hang. And it would just be Jeffrey Wagon be like, I can't talk about that. It's in my confidentiality yeah. agreement. Want to go hit? <laughs> Want to go suddenly hit some golf balls? Wagon, you think uh, Knicks are going to make the semifinals <laughs> this year? To my confidentiality agreement, I can't, I can't disclose uh, that. We got it. So we got to take that out and put that in the nip picks too. Yeah. Semifinals. Come on, Michael Mann. What else outside the zone? I don't know. You think the Knicks are going to make it to the semifinals? Just get one guy in the set who's followed sports for five minutes. Not ideal. Nobody's ever said semifinals. Ninety nine Knicks. NBA. Yeah. It, conference it, finals. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they were in the NBA finals that year. We would say third round or conference Sorry. finals. How dare you? <laughs> that is true. That might have been the last great Knicks. The last great Knicks moment was, <laughs> was, was this movie. <laughs> it is. Ah, the Knicks. You think the Knicks are going to get Zion? <laughs> Ooh, uh, <laughs> I like RJ Barrett. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have had- Jared Kova. <laughs> <laughs> I had coffee with Marcus Camby half an hour ago. <laughs> That was a foul <laughs> on John Starks. <laughs> they should, there should really, there should be a James Dolan biopic starring Al Pacino. Who says no? Because then he would just play blues, the blues the entire time. They yeah. knew Donnie overact- Walsh in a wheelchair <laughs> trying to impress LeBron James. What are we doing? <laughs> 
the heat's making us all, I think, a little loopy. It's the hot heat, in the, the studio heat has right drawn now. you back to heat. They knew overacting award goes to the three of us for that, yeah. that run of Pacino talking about the Knicks. Um, best quote. Ligand, fuck it, let's go to court. Fuck it. Let's go to court. Dr. Ligand would like to leave now. Can I ask a quick question? Has there ever been a bad line of dialogue that started, fuck it, let's? No. If you start a line of dialogue no. with fuck it, let's do something, no. you're guaranteed to get my attention. Like fuck it, let's be legends. Fuck it, let's play some cards. Yeah. Just watched that last week. <laughs> you Round know what's, It's so disappointing though. They get to Atlantic City. Worm goes with a hooker. Matt Damon goes to play with all his friends from the Chesterfield. And then they leave pretty quickly. It's like, what? what you wanted to we, get more time with the hooker? one run? No, one, one run, you guys, at some table just... Bilk in the tourists for like a half hour, maybe? I don't know. Should we just re-record the Rounders rewatch? Right now, as Al Pacino talking right. about the Knicks? No, but I do. I am ready to do Heat again. When we have the 100 <laughs> rewatchables, I just want to do Heat again. I have a lot more thoughts on Heat. Okay. More best quotes, uh, Mike Wallace. Mike? Try Mr. Wallace. We work in the same corporation doesn't mean we work in the same profession. Yeah, that was great. Bergman, I want you to tell him in these words, get on the fucking phone! <laughs> yeah. I, I can't say that. No, 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 you can't. Tell him to get on the fucking phone! He, he told me to tell you to get on the fucking phone! Love that. Uh, <laughs> you, we should have made you wear the Pacino wig from this movie as you did this. <laughs> but a Phil Spector wig from the Then uh, there's the whole the Bergman thing where he's like, and he's only the key witness in the biggest public health reform issue, maybe the biggest, most expensive corporate malfeasance case in U.S. history! <laughs> Are we going to air it? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because he's not telling the truth? No. Because he is telling the truth. Loved it. And then Hewitt, you fucked us. Bergman, no, you fucked you. Don't invert stuff. I got another one. You fucked you is the quote for me. I love when he's on the phone with the FBI guy. Oh, yeah. And he's like, you better take a good look because I'm getting two things. Pissed off and curious. <laughs> <laughs> All right, when I get a chance, I'll give it a look. You better take a good look because I'm getting two things. Pissed off and curious. Now, look, <laughs> but don't touch. His cadence is incredible. My goal in life is to never have a conversation with either of you that ends with one of you yelling at me, no, you fucked you. You <laughs> fucked you, Bill. I'll be like, what? I Are we going to air it? Of course not. <laughs> I like, um, I like a, almost everything Plummer says, but I also like when he... At the end of the movie, when he said, right after he says, You fucked you, Plummer's like, You fucked up, Don. Yeah. Very calmly. Yeah. yeah. And then he's like, You know, these things have 15 minute shelf life. And he's a, he says, Fame has a 15 minute half life. Infamy lasts a little longer. That's like a really good and line then of dialogue. And knowing what we know, it's also a dart. Uh, there I also really some good, like, there's some really well written like lines. It's this, a great story. Like, I was reading the insider quote page. The top one on the IMDb was the Mike Wallace says, Who are these people? And Lois says, Ordinary people under extraordinary pressure, yeah. mm -hmm. Mike. What the hell did you expect? Grace and consistency? There's a lot of That's like just one. really well-written, yeah. scripted whatevers. I enjoyed it. I really, really enjoyed rewatching this. Loved uh, Philip Baker Hall being like, you're an anarchist! <laughs> <laughs> By the way, we didn't talk about the Philip Baker Hall 90s run. Mac how about just his 99? Magnolia if, and this? You go from 89 to 99 because then you can get Midnight Run in there. Yeah. And that like 11-year mm -hmm. run. I'm going to stab you with a fucking pencil, yeah. Sydney. Have a cream soda. <laughs> and Boogie Nights, Seinfeld. Yeah. It's incredible. Heart 8. Heart 8, Sydney. Um, Wait, it, one more line. Yeah, sure. I like. I, I just, I can't get Pacino's voice out of my Do head it. now. He's like, I fought for you and I still fight for you. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Apex Mountain. Yeah. Um, Pacino, Crow, Plumber. Bruce McGill, definitely. Is it Pacino's the Apex Mountain? No, God, no. no is it, not for anybody. I don't think it's Crows either. I think no. Crows is Gladiator. The, go the golfing henchman guy, definitely. Yeah, that guy, <laughs> Kepka? That guy was amazing. <laughs> it's either this weekend when he wins the PGA or that Or when, yeah. he, when he yeah. golfed in a God, suit. God, so good. The really nice swing. Striping it. It's great. Just a nice kept shot his, shape. Kept his weight back. Yeah, fading just really a little bit. It really kind of exploded through wearing a suit. It's <laughs> yeah. hard to do. Uh, I guess, is this Christopher Plummer's Apex Mountain? Yeah, Sound of Music. Yeah, I think it's probably okay. going to be Sound of Music. Nobody's Apex Mountain. This is the longest Joey Pants nominee field, the yeah. biggest field we've ever had. Is this, is, the, the is this man's Apex Mountain just in terms of his ability to do, because getting this movie made, 
is a kind of an amazing it's achievement. I think of where he was after he he takes like three, four years after he he is and does this. That that's in the truest constitutional originalist reading of Apex Mountain. <laughs> but he he allowed, allowed him Scalia. to do that though. And he he had De Niro and Pacino at a point when that yeah. still mattered yeah, yeah. and got like the best possible movie out of them. We've talked about every single person. And, it, and he's getting two rewatchable podcasts out of the same movie. I mean, mm-hmm. if that's, that's not true. Apex Mountain. I don't know what it is. We uh, had so many Joey Pants guys. Philip Baker Hall, Gina Gershon, Stephen Tobolowsky, Rip Thorn. Torn. Torn. Sorry. Rip Torn. My bad. I mispronounced that. Rip Torn kind of wasted in this movie. The, Why couldn't he have been Wings They Houser? never film him head on. I yeah. think he had stuff that was cut. He must. He must have. Right. Yeah. He was big then because Larry Sanders had just yeah. ended. Yeah. He was, that was like rip torn momentum. Hallie Eisenberg, the Pepsi girl from the Pepsi commercials, plays uh, Wygan's daughter. Colm Fior, Debbie Mazar, Lindsey Krauss, Michael Gambon, and Esther Serrano as the I FBI think guy. For me, the winner because we already did Bruce McGill. Unless we're just going to give this to Bruce McGill again. Or, I like the idea of McGill winning the triple crown. The triple crown is fun. I do think Lindsay Krauss, a lot of people don't know what her name is. And meanwhile, she's like this really, really accomplished, beloved actress. Go find House of Games. House yeah. of Games is amazing. Yeah. So one of those two I would go. Could this work as a 10-episode Netflix show in 2019? Yeah, it would be amazing. I would watch that. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Would you, would it work if it was f- like it filmed in the same way? More smoking. Like all this, like the golf. It was like an episode was just looking at the golf. To make it yeah. truly 99 feeling, we replaced Dead Can Dance with Rage Against the Machine on Good. the soundtrack. Good. Good idea. Yes? Yes. Who won I'd the movie? Run, Or a sequel where he, Jeffrey Wagan, starts dating the broadcast news lady. Nice. What yeah. if they end up together? There's a, a they su- met on a, like an investigative piece. Yeah, Jeff and Sue. Jeff and, and Sue. It's more of a Benny and June style movie. She actually, gets mad about the golf thing. He's, <laughs> she's high energy. I actually think that's a good yeah, match. That's great. I would watch a Twitch stream that was just Lil Bergman and Jeffrey Wagan watching Knicks games. <laughs> Watching the semifinals you think they'll make together. The semifinals. <laughs> what do you think about uh, Faraday and Wygand on the Golf Channel? Oh yeah, together teaming up. Jeffrey wow. Wygand, <laughs> you, you golfing loafer, sir. How hard was that? And you didn't break your confidentiality agreement, sir. You wearing a tie? <laughs> was he wearing a tie, or is just he had this shirt? When I think of the great performances on a Sunday, sir, I think of Brooks Kepka <laughs> at Aaron Hills, and <laughs> you. At the Louisville <laughs> men's driving range. This is the same accent as Bono. <laughs> that doesn't this sound is, anything like Faraday. This, this is Bono <laughs> as David Faraday. It feels like it's also retroactively shaking your confidence in Bono. Like you're now <laughs> wondering whether or not Bono isn't Bono. It's not. <laughs> Can I tell you a Bono story? Sure. I saw this movie about Luciano Pavarotti. Yeah. And Bono is interviewed in the movie and he's talking about how Pavarotti is one of his truest friends. But he talked about how he... Uh, tricked him into participating in the Pavarotti and Friends um, charity concert. And he described him as, uh, I, I can't do the Bono voice. If Maybe if you could just repeat sure. this, but he called him a world-class emotional arm wrestler. He's who, a world-class emotional arm wrestler, <laughs> sir. <laughs> and he, David Faraday? <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he said he'd break your arm if he could. That's great. Yeah, it was good stuff. Great. Jesus. Love Bono. Bono. What a blowhard. Nobody's more of an artist than Francesco Molinari <laughs> with a six iron on his hand. He's a painter. A renaissance painter. <laughs> it's a little hot in this room. Yeah, let's get out of here. Who won the movie? <laughs> oh, unquestionably for me, Pacino. Pacino. I thought he was so good in this movie. Completely agree. What a year for him. Yeah. This and any given Sunday in the same year, that's iconic. I love this performance. Yeah. Um, for Charlie Ward... For David Faraday, for Jeffrey Wigand, and for Luminary Media. <laughs> for Luminary Media, I'm Chris Ryan. For Bill Simmons and Sean Fennessy, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to Rewatchables 1999. We have more coming. We, I think we have like four or five more in this run, and mm-hmm. then uh, a bunch more coming. Yeah, and if you don't here. subscribe, you fucked you! <laughs> <laughs>